these sessions, uh, what we're calling these, is, uh, this, is, this is our legislative series. Um, start from the top, my name is Mark Hughes, I'm the Executive Director of Justice for All, a racial justice organization that was started here in uh, Cabot, Vermont, and I've been a director there for about five and a half years. And uh, through our work, most of it being community outreach and organizing, uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, what we call relationship management with elected officials and, and, and law enforcement and so forth, but um, which ultimately, ultimately led to uh, a, a, you know, what we desired was the legislative agenda, um, where, where that kind of, um, we bounce around a little bit. So where that took us was is we created this organization, or group of organizations called the Racial Justice Reform Coalition, moved a couple of policies there, and, uh, and then, um, let me ask you to introduce yourself next, group. And so, um, and, and that kind of morphed into what we call a racial justice alliance, uh, which is a again kind of the same thing, but it's really uh, there is a um, a um, people of color steering committee um, that you know we have about maybe twelve or fifteen of us. This, uh, this is mine. He's going to talk a few of, in a few minutes. He's one of one of those uh, folks that are on that steering committee. Um, so this session, we, you know, we're driving, you know, more policy. The, the, the purpose of the legislative session, uh, this, this, I'm sorry, the legislative series is really to be able to bring community in, to gain community perspective, uh, to also, um, to, you know, to teach and educate community about, you know, policy and policy positions. And then also the critical piece is to be able to inform uh, you know, the uh, deliberative process of our legislative officials as well. So we're doing all of that in this what we call legislative series. Uh, we've already had one. Uh, it was on data. Uh, we called it uh, making the justice <laughs> work with data. Uh, that you can find that on ORCA. Um, or how many people know what ORCA is? Um, so um, let me just pause here for a minute. Um, is there anybody in the room who just don't want to be on camera at all? Don't feel shy, because I can just we can just tell them to leave, or else we can just not point the camera at you. Okay, great. So uh, Orca, Orca Media is one of the many, many community uh, community community um, community television uh, affiliates across this entire state. Okay, there, you have one in Barry, there's one, there's a couple in Burlington, and they all they have, they plug into a network, <laughs> literally a network where what they film can also be, if you will broadcast across the entire state, and then in, in some cases even across the nation. So um, I just, just in case you're on the Federal Women's Protection Program, I just wanted to make sure that we were all good. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, back to what we're doing. I, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing that we're doing in conjunction uh, with this, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as brief as possible, if I'm moving too quickly, just throw something at me. I just want to try to get to the meat of what we're doing here. Is, is we're also doing uh, this thing called a uh, hidden and plain sight, uh, which is a statewide community um, kind of a um, community tour. Uh, we've been, we've been to uh, Hartford. Uh, we've been to Barry. Uh, we had to postpone um, St. Albans. Uh, so we're we'll, and these are all in public libraries across the state. Uh, we'll be in Burlington uh, on the fourth on the 4th of March. Uh, I think there's going to be a pretty good crowd there. <clears throat> Again, this, this, ser this um, community outreach is, is really about, you know, um, really getting right up against this conversation about systemic racism and what that is. And it kind of gets into a historical context and it kind of lays things out. What, it occurred, to, what, it, what occurred to me was is that, you know, and also in our uh, discussions, deliberations within our um, uh, people of color steering committee meeting and just a whole lot of conversation with Christine, you know, who's, you guys probably know is my partner as well, is, is um, the legislators have really done a phenomenal job over the last couple of years at, at trying to get their hands around this, and it, some of it is elusive, and um, we, some of them have actually, and this is a military term, outrun their cover, so to speak. Uh, there are communities across the state who have no idea uh, you know, who or what the executive director of racial equity is or why she exists, for example. Um, uh, there are communities across the state who have no idea what Act 54 was all about. Remember that? When we did all that work to try to uh, get in place in racial disparities. 
in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel, and the Attorney General and the Human Rights Commission Executive Director did that statewide tour and produced another report uh, indicating racial disparities across housing, education, employment, health services access. Well, you know, you go out to Hardwick, or you maybe maybe you go out, you know, maybe over in Franklin. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the town of Franklin. Yes, that's the thing. Um, is is that you know, there's a lot of folks who don't know these things. So it, we are just making every effort to kind of go back out and do the work that needs to be done. And it's not work; it's actually a blast because it's good to get you know folks in the room who don't agree with you. It's good to get folks in the room who have different perspectives and who have different ideas and respect them and give them that place uh, where they can um, where they can um, you know offer uh, that perspective. And and, uh, and we too can be enlightened by their perspectives. And we can you know pull that together and make what we've done better. So it's, it's a great opportunity. I'm, I'm experiencing it. If there's anybody in the room who wants to take that trip with me, just go on to vtracialjusticealliance.wordpress.com. Look at the a list of uh, places where we're going to be, or shoot me a note and say, "Hey, Mark, I want to get on the road with you. I'm glad to take you." And that includes you, Dave. If you want to, if you want to come and hang out with us, I've, I've hung out with you. I'm sure you, you probably. Okay. Have. So I went down to the. <clears throat> yeah. No, I'm just. That's a just inviting you. Just inviting you because. So um, so here we so here we go. Here we are, and today we're going to be talking about one of oh I forgot, but I forgot to tell you this: is these sessions that we're having, these forums, they're all connected to policy, the policy that we move forward, the 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 uh, data uh, the data initiative, the data form that we did a few weeks ago is directly related to H two eighty four. In case you were wondering, okay, with the um, with the Justice Reinvestment Act coming forward, I think they're calling it three thirty eight now or something like that. That's three thirty eight. Um, and it moving over towards government operations in the House, or, I'm sorry, uh, judiciary in the House, um, you know, Maxine Grab is going to be keenly um, um, kind of anticipating that coming over in conjunction with the work that needs to be done here with data. Data in the justice system is pivotal. Uh, we got a lot of work to do, garbage in, garbage out, we got to fix it. So that was that. This here, is, it, this is all about, this whole idea is, is it a good idea to create a, um, a task force that's going to go off and consider uh, a state apology and maybe even a, pro a, a proposal uh, for reparations for the state of Vermont, their role in slavery. Because we do know from our work that we've done on PR2, which successfully passed this, just this last, uh, you know, this uh, biennium, um, that is the first stage of it. We'll come back to what that entails, the rest of it. But it did pass, it made the first hurdle. But the work that we've done on PR2, we, we've come to understand our role in slavery as a state more and more, more and more. Uh, we, we've, we've also, we also understand even if, you know, it doesn't make any difference what state you are, if you are part of the United States, there was always a role. So as we watch uh, H.R. 40 at the national level, as, um, as, as for the first time in 30 years, this bill that was introduced by the late um, John Conyers in, in 1989, as it begins to move forward uh, in the United States House of Representatives, uh, and for the first time gain traction and, and build uh, the prospect of potentially uh, maybe make it to the Senate uh, for the first time in history, that's 30 years, uh, why would we not want to uh, begin as a progressive and, uh, and, and also as a, uh, as, uh, as a state that is, uh, has historically led from the front? Uh, why would we not want to be um, you know, on, that, you know, you know, on that list of folks who are of, of great first? So that's what that's about tonight. I'm going to give you a lot of detail tonight about what's, you know, what's you know, behind this thing, you know, because it's easy to talk about. I want to give you some more detail about this whole concept of reparations. I want to give you some detail about, you know, what it really means and, and give you some historical reference on where it has occurred in other places and how it's occurred. I want to welcome those of you who come from UVM. Uh, we've been working with uh, UVM up in Burlington. A uh, class of 28 people became interested in this work, and they're behind the scenes, and they're pushing uh, as well. There are folks from the ACLU, from the NAACP. Uh, we have uh, support from uh, unlikely characters like the NEA, yes, the NEA, uh, the uh, Episcopal Diocese as well. So there are, there are, there are, there's a force that's building behind some of this work, this important work. Um, I'm going to go and fiddle around with this thing right here, and I want to introduce my colleague, um, another member of the uh, People of Color Steering Committee. And uh, from that point, if you wouldn't mind just facilitating an introduction of, of the rest of the folks in the room. Awesome. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. So my name is Kuman. I started with Victor Justice Alliance on the People of Color Steering Committee about a year ago, and I'm still on that now. And kind of transitioned 
to become a policy analyst for Rich Justice Alliance and becoming more involved, <coughs> excuse me, in the policy making um, that goes on in the State House and, and how people uh, like students at UVM, so I'm a UVM grad student as well, um, can get more involved in the process in terms of what matters to them, what may or may not affect them as well. Um, so now I'm going to next role facilitate introductions. So I guess we can start from this side. Did you say that you were a graduate student? I did say I'm a graduate student. I would start from this side and, and uh, name and really how, however you want to identify yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Basha Sabalaska. I am an MSW student at UVM. Oh, which one is From where? Oh. My name is Michelle. I'm a graduate student at um, University of Vermont, and I'm originally from Barrie. <laughs> nice. Um, my name is Avalon. I'm from the Community College of Vermont, and I'm a senior. My name is David Zuckerman. I'm from Hinesburg, Vermont, and I'm a former and uh, lieutenant governor. And the candidate for governor. Let's not forget that part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, typically in this building, I tend to. I know. Yeah, people are, That's people why are I pretty think. sensitive about it, so. Yeah. Well, thank you. We make a big deal about it. Okay. Is there anyone back there? There's nobody yeah. behind. I'm Brian Chino. I'm a representative from Burlington. And I'm going to have to leave soon to go to a meeting in Burlington, but I wanted to hang out for a little bit. Let me, let me just add, too, that, because um, Brian's kind of a strange animal, right. I'm saying, and I'm going to make it sound I'm a lot better. I'm side work. Yeah, uh, but uh, Brian, Brian is also a member of the People of Color Steering Committee meeting, uh, a steering committee as well, and is as a, as a very, very close ally and a dear friend uh, of mine as well. And so we, we do a lot of work. Uh, uh, we do a lot of work in Burlington. Uh, I didn't. I didn't mention it, but um, there's a lot of stuff. As you, as those from those of you who've been watching the newspaper, there's a lot of stuff happening. It's the biggest uh, city, obviously, or town, if you will, in the state. Um, Brian's got you know previous uh, experience, you know, working on the inner parts of the government. There, um, it's been instrumental in um, you know being able to lay a pathway for you know, us being able to make those, you know, develop those relationships with. Members of the city council like Max Tracy and Ali Dean, like uh, Perry Freeman and Jack Hansen, uh, to name a few. Um, you know we have we have moved um, you know in the city council uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion executive a director position at the at the city level uh, in Burlington as a result of the work that we've been doing here. Uh, we've also established uh, we've established a. Um, a requirement for mandatory data collection for use of force uh, for our, our the second largest department in the state. I'm, I'm one of the commissioners, by the way. Um, just before you start talking trash about it, further to police, just know that I'm going to be representing as well. Um, and um, and in addition to that, we've established a, a permanent uh, or a, a, a um, permanent or a standing, if you will, committee of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is unprecedented. Uh, on the uh, city council itself. So, um, so Brian, I want to just, I know you got to leave, but I want to just, you know, give you a shout out and thank you for being in the room and, and let you know. Oh, by the way, he also um, is our, one of our key sponsors of every bill that goes through the house. If you see an H in front of it, thank Brian, okay? So. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Rick Barstow. Bless you. Been a friend of Mark's for quite a while, following his, his work in the Judiciary Committee a few years ago. Um, you know, he's been doing a lot of really great work here, and uh, I saw that he was going to be here tonight, so I've got to come down and catch up. Nice. So my, my name is Gwendolyn Hallsmith. I'm from Cabot, Vermont. We live in an eco-village there called the Headwaters Garden and Learning Center. We also are here representing Vermonters for a New Economy, where we are working on how we pay for reparations, how we pay for Medicare for all, how we pay for all the things that we need to deal with the climate crisis and the human rights crisis and the poverty crisis on the planet. Uh, my name is Michael Taub and I'm here with Gwen from Cabot. And I'm glad to hear that this discussion is happening. 
Uh, I'm Carter Shapiro, even pronouns. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Vermont. Um, I've been involved with uh, various amounts of organizing, um, done quite a few things regarding racial justice and um, gender inclusion. So, and I'm, I'm just, I'm interning with uh, Representative Lizzie Rogers in the Social Equity Caucus that's kind of being uh, formed and created. So that's why yeah, I'm here. Do you get paid to be an intern? I could through the university. <laughs> the university they're push, yeah, they've been <laughs> pushing that like even if you're interning or doing it for credits, even if you're doing it for credits, you should still be able to be paid. So I agree with that. So yeah. Yeah, I just want to offer that uh, our office requested it together because we've had interns in our office for years um, to uh, add some money to our budget to be able to pay our interns and they declined to give us that money wow. um, in the budget request. But it's been an ongoing challenge because as many people may or may not know, those who can afford to do internships that are that don't cost anything, give them a leg up on future opportunities. Mm -hmm. And since we have a historical legacy issues of income inequality, particularly for communities of color, that then continues to create hurdles for people to get access to opportunities mm -hmm. by not having those internships be paid. So um, there's just so many subtle and not so subtle. They're subtle to those of us who have privilege and it's not so subtle to those that don't. Um, elements like that that continue the inequality, for sure. So. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, you got it. Uh, I'm Kevin Coach Christie, uh, representative from Hartford. Um, I won't get into my hats that I wear. I'd like to hear a couple of my hats, please. <laughs> well, the they, push. well <laughs> they, <laughs> they represent the hats. That's right. <laughs> um, now, I, I, I guess, I, I like to consider myself uh, a, a public servant. Uh, I've been working in the state of Vermont on um, just people's issues since the, uh, oh, Dave, excuse me, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's been a while. <laughs> I, I started to go back in the dates, and I'm going, wow, man, I started back then. But anyways, uh, it's, it's been a long time. Uh, I presently chair the Human Rights Commission. Um, I chair the Hartford School Board. Uh, really proud of the work we're doing there. Um, Hartford has a very similar uh, project like Burlington. It's called H. Corey, the Hartford Committee on mm -hmm. Racial uh, Equity and Equality. Uh, and uh, we're doing some good work. Uh, we hired a consultant, came in and did a uh, an in-depth dive uh, into the town and the school district uh, uh, looking at systemic racism uh, within the two bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're formulating a, uh, a strategic plan, uh, which we should be getting in the next week or so. Uh, and it, it's been a five-year you know, process you know, to get to, uh, to where we are with that particular group. Uh, and then, you know, I just try to keep stirring the pot, you know, because that, that's what we're supposed to be doing, you know, at least as long as we can, right? So, I guess that's the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Do you serve on the Board of Trustees at UVM? Yes, I do. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what specific committee? Um, uh, finance. Um, and we're still figuring out a couple of more. Is that, and does that include the investment in the endowment, endowment excuse me, in the endowment? Uh, we're starting those discussions. Okay. Yeah. As, a, as a UVM student, I can't speak for other mm -hmm. uh, people that represent UVM mm -hmm. here. But, uh, and, I don't, and I do not know your stance on this either, but I highly recommend, and a lot of my peers would agree with me, to divest from fossil fuels. Well, you know, I'm sick of that. You know, I, I know everybody's, you know, where everybody's at, you know, like with that um, and the reality of the situation, because I will always speak the truth, whether you like what you, you know, you hear or not. But the reality of the situation is some of those things um, are well within our purview, you know, as the, as the Board of Trustees, but, but moving that is kind of similar to moving 
uh, a massive ship. You know, so the fact that a number of us on the board agree wholeheartedly with that, the divestment isn't as easy as it looks on the surface because we're talking in the range of millions of dollars in oh, investments, so you know, so but, but it's, it's, it just, it just doesn't happen like that, you know, is, I guess is the point, you know. Can, can I say something about this and then tie it into reparations? Yeah. Um, right. Not to change the subject. You, you may not need to tie it into reparations yet because there might be somebody else who wants to chime in. Okay. Well, I, there, there's a sort of a connection, a parallel I see. So um, I, I have asked the legislative council um, to create a bill for me that would completely divest the state of uh, Vermont from fossil fuels, private prisons, pharmaceutical industry, and weapons production. And they told me that there's there were now I'm not going to remember the, the exact four layers. But remember you're on camera. I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and they told me there were four <laughs> layers. <laughs> um, so um, they told me there were four layers, and I can't remember them exactly. But basically, the first layer was the simplest one, which is like <laughs> saying like, oh, we're gonna not put. We're not going to buy stocks and put money in pensions that use that puts money in these in these things. But that's easy when you're directly investing. But when you're paying an investor for funds where they're putting that fund into like thousands of stocks, that's the second layer where it starts to get really hard because it's hard. It's it's not impossible, but it starts to get hard. And I think this is what you're getting at: is it gets, actually gets complicated the way it's structured. I can't remember what the third layer was, but the fourth layer was the one that was the most disturbing. And actually, I'm looking at the camera. Chocolate, for this. chocolate cream pie at the bottom of the layer. There's a layer. Yeah. Too. Well, the fourth layer is what I think ties to reparations in some in some abstract way. The fourth layer is the one that's most disturbing, which is that our entire financial system has been designed so that if you engage in any digital transactions, any digital monetary transactions, you are, you are giving money to those companies. And the reason is that the way the whole financial system's been built, that the banks that are running that are, like every single one of them is connected to, is investing in those industries. So if you're using a credit card, even a credit union credit card, if it has MasterCard, Visa, those mm -hmm. symbols on it, mm -hmm. like basically the, the foundation of our financial system is, in, is completely interlaced with those industries and that the only way Vermont could completely divest is to create our own economy and separate from, like this is what the lawyers told me. <laughs> no, but, but even that, it's like we would have no outside trade. Like we would literally, it would be like North Korea. You know, like, like so, so then I dropped it because I was like, the idea is like, it's, I didn't want to make, you know, I, I, dropped, I dropped it at that point, but I'm just putting it out there because there's layers of investment and in, in, in the parallel I see with reparations is that if you dig deep enough into our economic system, so much of everything we have was grounded in slavery. And we don't want to talk about it. You know, it's like, why is fossil fuels so integrated into the financial system? Why pharmaceuticals? Why the prison industry? And if you go back far enough, it means the slavery economy. It's the roots of the country. I don't know, sorry to go off on it, but, but I just think to your po point, it is tricky. Like, I do think UVM could say, we're going to not directly invest, and they could say we're going to try to find stock brokers who don't, who 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 are socially responsible. You know, they could do that, but well, they couldn't completely the, divest. Well, well, the thing is, is uh, one of the things you'll notice is, is that there's been uh, some changes in the board structure, and in that changes, you know, we're looking at some of those points. Because it's all layered, like like Brian said, but it, it is the commitment, you know, to move in that direction, you know. So, you know, that's. I just want to yeah. kind of in and done. No, no, go ahead. I also want to add, while it's complicated, it's also been talked about for over ten or fifteen years, yeah. Yeah. and many states and many institutions mm -hmm. have figured out right. how to get through those complications. Mm -hmm. That's and even mm -hmm. if it isn't the deeper exactly. aspect of being a part of yeah. the economic yeah. reality yeah. that we live in, mm -hmm. which is interconnected yeah. to all this, mm -hmm. at least the direct investments, mm -hmm. uh, many institutions have figured mm -hmm. out how to do that. Yeah. Um, and, so that's, and that's the rest of it. You know, and, and the thing is, I'm new to the, uh, to the board. Uh, I'm not afraid to 
to stir it up because I've already kind of did a few things and they're not happy, but that's okay. You know, because that's what the legislature sent me there to do, right. was to stir it up a little bit, so. I want to go to Gwendolyn and then I'm going to kind of steer us back on, but, but we're also going to have a breakout session, if, if we have time, we're going to have a breakout session and talk a little bit, give everybody a little bit more chance to speak, speak in smaller I would leave too, because we have yeah. sales that are firing, which is actually pretty cold. Too. I'm going to be working with Deb to coordinate our next meeting to kind of overlap onto okay. your, uh, your film viewing, right. so we can just abbreviate our meeting, because we're going to be in the building at the same time, right. and I don't feel good about that, so we're going to abbreviate our next meeting, we're going to put it in the same venue, we're going to put it up in front of your right. film viewing, so we can all be together, okay? Right. I appreciate what you're doing. What is that? You on the 26th, I think. The 26th of this month, and it's going to happen again uh, next Thursday. Thursday. That's the 27th. I, th I think, it, yeah, that. Ask Dev Wolf. I'm saving it now. Okay. Yeah, Dev Wolf. Saving it now. <laughs> I'm going to have to leave, too. I'm sorry. I want no, to talk more. About I, it. I have to get back to Bruce. I'm learning to live to fight another day with legislators and elected officials, and it's just good that you guys would have the, you know, the, the presence to stop in and, yeah. and, and not be a part of this. So don't feel shy about getting up and, and stepping out even. If you gotta go right now, that's fine. I will. Uh, yeah, but exactly. I just wanna hear, I, I really want you to hear what Gwendolyn says before you leave. <laughs> no, I was just gonna follow up on what Brian was saying about the, the layers of it. Because yeah. actually UVM, the Gunn Institute of Ecological Economics, did a study of this several years ago, and I have some of the materials, if anybody's interested, when they looked at what would happen if something like UVM divested from fossil fuels, in the current investment scheme that we have, it means like moving the money from ExxonMobil to Walmart. But the embedded fossil fuel costs in Walmart are really high. That's not accounted for in a lot of the ways that people are looking at actually divesting. And the conclusion of that study was that if we really do want to divest from fossil fuels, and this ties into reparations, we need to look at the local economy as the alternative to all the big structured Wall Street mutual fund type investments. Mm -hmm. that you can direct your investment a lot more carefully in the local economy than you can in that world of investment. Which brings me to you know, the other really important point about reparations, that if we had public money, public money oh, is bigger you? than public banks. Okay, Public banks are just this little sort of institution that could maybe fit in and play with the big guys if they let us. And they don't. You know, let's just face facts. Uh, getting a public bank is really impossible. It's a paradigm change. So if we're going to change the paradigm, we need to change it to public money, which basically takes the function of money out of the hands of the private banks, bondholders, and the 1% of the world, and puts it back in our hands. And that's how we pay for reparations. That's where we could invest as an alternative to all the fossil fuel, Walmart, big money investments that are the only ones available if you're working in the stock market environment. Thank Thanks for that. Gwen, can you, um, can you tell us that uh, organization that I keep, I can't, I don't want to, I don't want to trash the name of the organization. The, uh, is it? Which one? For, for just something, economy or something like that? Vermonters for a New Economy. It, what's the website? Um, NewEconomyVT.org. New but economy. it's, you know, I'm not very good at keeping websites updated. Uh, yeah, but there's enough really information on there for people to get the just idea. Just write to me if you're interested in yeah. all of this. I'm happy to, I've written books, I've say got your, lots of educational materials. Say your email address it's here. Gwen, G-W-E-N, H-S, is in Sam, like Gwen Halsta, at Gmail. Y'all got that? No. Gwen H S at Gmail. Can you spell Gwen again? H S. G W E N. H S. Yeah, you'll want to, you'll want to catch up with her. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to. You might want to go out to the house for dinner too. <laughs> <laughs> or ice cream. <laughs> he just opens that door right now. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a blast out there when the weather's good. I love it out there. Hey, even when it snows, it's not bad out there. 
I've been trapped out there since now. <laughs> so I, that, that was a, that was an awesome pivot. Uh, I want to um, again. I want to thank. I want to thank you. I want to welcome everybody here. I got Dave. Dave's card in my hand and there's Braille on it and I'm distracted because every time I get, you get this, I probably have about three of these and every time I get it, I'm like, it's Braille on this card. I want to read something to you real quick before we get started. I'll get a presentation up for you in a second. <clears throat> this is a report from the Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent on its mission to the United States of America uh, in 2016, um, the Human Rights Council. No, I'm not going to put this on the screen. I'm just going to, I'm just going to read part of this. Um, and if anybody wants it, I'll send you the whole report. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not going to... Because if I put it on the screen, then I'm going to have to take it down and all that. It's a technology thing. Because I, I have a presentation queued up. There's only one report. Uh, one uh, point in the report that I want to refer you to is, and that is... You know what, Mom, I'm going to take your advice. Because, because folk, folk are visual, right? So let's just get at that. Okay? I'm going to... If somebody younger than you tells you to do something, just do it, okay? <laughs> just do it. So this is um, in the recommendation section. and I want to bring your attention to item 94. It says, the working group encourages Congress to pass H.R. 40, the Commission to Study Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act which would establish a commission to examine enslavement and racial discrimination in the colonies in the United States from 1619 to the present and to recommend appropriate remedies. The working group urges the United States to consider seriously applying analogous elements contained in the Caribbean Community 10-Point Action Plan on reparations, which include a formal apology, health initiatives, educational opportunities, an African knowledge program, psychological rehabilitation, Technology transfer and financial support and so forth. And that cancellation. Yeah. So that thanks for that. So that's the report that was created in 2016. You can pull this down off of the General Assembly's website. Um, you recall, though many of you in the room probably recall that we, we actually are no longer a part of the the, uh, the uh, Human Rights Council of the United Nations. Um, nor have we ever uh, been a participant in any treaty that would give anyone of African descent any standing uh, with any claim. Um, but the United States, but the United Nations continues uh, to call us out uh, on this and other stuff. So sometimes it's good just to take a look at what, you know, oh, by the way, we were, we were pivotal. We were pivotal in the creation of the United Nations. I think it was in 1946, right? So. It's just interesting to see sometimes how what we look like from the outside in. So before, I'm, I think I'm going to start this as a course of uh, introduction uh, in this conversation and moving forward is, is before we start taking a look at ourselves from the inside, let's talk about what's being said to us from the outside. Now this was 2016, okay? Uh, and and there's, there's a lot that the United Nations has to say about us. Much of which I won't go into right now, but I highly encourage you to download uh, this and other reports. Um, and many of the things that we've been talking about from data collection uh, to um, dis disciplinary, uh, uh, discriminatory disciplinary practices in our schools, we're being called out at the United Nations uh, in, a, in a really big kind of way. In fact, eerily, <clears throat> um, I kind of looked at these reports and I looked at the agenda of the current administration, and you'd think that they read them too. And that what they're actually doing is, is using these reports as a playbook doc to take us in the opposite direction. Eerily. That's, 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 that's my personal assessment of it. Okay? So I want to talk a little bit about um, this whole business on reparations. And I've, I've got a presentation for you, and I, I think where we, where we start with this thing, uh, We'll start here. See if I can see if I can figure out where we had another presentation here, but let me see where are we? Okay, where are we? Nope, that's not it. That's why I didn't want to put that up because I because I have no idea what I'm doing right now. Oh, I see, I see where I'm at now. Okay, let's see. There is a. Uh, 
Hi, I got Sister Grace's presentation. Thank you. I wonder if this is the right presentation. Let me take a closer look at that. So I'll just start talking to you before I get started. Is is that this um, work that we're doing on this particular bill is really modeled after uh, HR uh, HR forty the the uh, the bill that's in, in the, the United States House of Representatives that we were just that uh, the United Nations was just telling us about. Um, I I know that because I, I wrote this bill. Um, and I basically, you know, it was just highly plagiarized, and uh, and um, I just, I thought it was a, a good idea because of the work that we've been doing and the trajectory that we're on. And I thought what we would do is, is at least put it out there. It's taken us as a nation. 30 years, 30 years from 1989 until now to actually make any significant movement on this bill in committee to even have a prospect of it to get out to the full floor of the House. Keep it in mind that it has to go to the Senate next, right? And then to the President's desk. So, um, <laughs> So that's kind of where that's kind of where we are on it, you know. How many people remember um, Tahas? What do you call it? How do you say Tahasne Coates? Tahasne Coates and, and Danny Glover and those folks that went up in August and testified on HR 40 over the summer. It it happened over the summer, so they, they actually introduced it. Uh, uh, her name, the representative's name is I think it's Sheila uh, Lee or something like that. Anyway, long story short is, is that it's been moving really slow at the national level and, and uh, right now um, I figured it was just as good as time as any. We're coming off of a conversation uh, where we've discovered that there are racial disparities across all systems of government here. Uh, that's what the Attorney General and the HRC, Human Rights Commission Executive Director, told us. We also understand there are racial disparities across the criminal justice system and we're doing work to try to get that done. Uh, we've yet to return and talk uh, about the, um, the, the former yet, um, but um, it, we, we got enough momentum to get an executive director of racial equity in place, and we have a racial equity panel, uh, so somebody's, somebody's listening somewhere. Um, we've been trying to, uh, to, to get you know, some, some, ha some handle around this whole um, o civilian oversight of law enforcement in the state. It, it's, and yes, it is directly related to what it is that we're talking about, um, from slave catchers to uh, police today. Uh, so um, we've, we've been really working hard to, to get that work done. We've been um, trying to focus more on data collection. How many people saw the race traffic stop data dashboard that was released? Uh, so we weren't able to get the state to do anything about it, so we created a grassroots effort. And we have a, a data dashboard where all 79 agencies, that data is aggregated. Uh, we've got some, um, some data geeks on our squad now. Um, so we, we created it. Six billion dollar government couldn't do it. Uh, so we did it. Um, so we're, we're continuing, but, but, we, but it, it, everything converges economically. And we'll talk more about what that looks like. Just tell me if something's coming out of my nose because I feel like I'm, something's going on. Am I OK in the camera? Yeah. Okay. Um, so what we want, you know, what we want to do is try to bring this conversation full, full circle. You know, the, you know, the the, the median wealth of African American family in, in the United States is is at uh, one thirteenth that of the median wealth of the the average the median wealth of a white family in the state. I said one thirteenth, okay. And there, there's no amount of hard work that will ever close that gap ever. So you got you got to ask yourself the question, you know, how did we get here, you know, you know, if you got to ask yourself the question, you know, why is it, you know, why is it that, you know, you know, if you're African American, that you're three times more likely to be terminated by this state's government <coughs> from employment, that you're six times more likely to be apprehended, and that you're like eleven times more likely to be in prison, why is it, you know, why why are all of these things true? Why is it that fifty percent of the time that African Americans go looking for an apartment that they're discriminated against. Why? So, so all of these things converge. There's got to be, there's got to be something that, that holds these things together. I mean, it's not. Those are a lot of freaking coincidences, you know. And you know, it's, it's hard to ignore, you know, where we've come from as a nation. 
you know, from the war on drugs, for example. Um, you know, maybe starting, you know, it's like 68, you know, let's choose Nixon, for example. Um, and, and just how, you know, not just um, poverty, but also uh, race, as well as activism, was criminalized, right, to a proliferation of 2.3 million people incarcerated with 1 million black people in prison. And considered a disenfranchisement. You know, it's not, I mean, and if that's not good enough, you have to go back between, you know, what is called the Great Migration, uh, or what I call it, the, the, the most horrendous internal refugee crisis in United States history. From 1910 until 1970, when black people flooded out of the South, running as fast as they could to get out of sharecropping, because they found out that it was just like convict leasing, which was just like slavery. The old Jim Crow in the South, as well as the North, lynching. The FBI, vastly Ku Klux Klan. This is our national history. And then in the North, redlining. The white GI Bill. The white New Deal. So these are, these are things that all are formative. You know, before that, you know, we had birth of a nation shown in the Oval Office under Woodrow Wilson. So we blatant racism, constitutional racism, uh, racism that was actually codified in our statutes. Redlining was not a commercial enterprise. It was a government enterprise. Okay? So we've got to ask ourselves if we've created this. You know, and we could go back. We could keep going back to even how our own constitution was written. In fact, we could go back to 1619 and talk about and move forward and talk about how, it, you know, after that, how in the House of Burgess that whiteness was created. And it was created for economic reasons. We could go back and talk about the fact that land was free for a minute. And to be eligible for it, you needed to be white. And labor was free as well. I mean, you had to be quite a loser if you come over here and got free land and free labor and not be successful. In fact, it was it became one of, it, what, what would occur is, is it was wildly successful beyond the imagination that any imagination that they could ever conceive the success of the creation which would cause us to be the wealthiest nation that ever existed in history of this planet today. In fact, it created collateral damage on white people, and they had to go back and co correct some of that, you know, with our white GI bills and our white New Deals and so forth. And that, that exists to this day, because there are many, many, many more poor white people than there are poor black people. There's only 12 to 13 percent of us here. It just stands to reason that although most black people are poor, most poor people are white. And that's why we have a shared and a common goal here to call this what it is. Because poverty affects all 140 million. And nearly 70 million of those are white people. So, yes, this is an economic, don't be confused, conversation. Reparations, the, this whole thing that we're talking about right now, it's all about economics. Are we here to figure out what it looks like and how to solve it? No. Um, we're not even asking, we're not even, I mean, within, within, I mean, within this particular session. But, 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 but what, what we're asking with this particular amendment is, is that we would appoint a group of folks to go off somewhere and talk about it and come back with some proposals to talk about whether or not an apology would be appropriate, to talk about whether or not reparations would be appropriate, and if so, what that would look like. Okay? So I just want to give a backdrop because when I was in, like for example, when I was in class the other day, I didn't really set you guys up very well. I was really flying at internet speed, trying to just get everything out. But I think that a conversation about reparations, if, it's, if you don't have a conversation about the history of this nation, which is exactly what Hidden in Plain Sight, the tour that I told you about across the state is, if you don't have that conversation, that was the slide presentation, in fact, that I was just paging through before I discovered that I had to run it up. Um, if you don't have that conversation, then this conversation doesn't make as much sense, okay? Um, because there's a lot of people looking for a problem to solve, okay? 
That's what we're going to do today, and I'm hoping to be able to have a breakout session. But before I do that, I want to talk about a definition, if you can capture this. Reparations is a process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people injured because of their group identity and in, and in violation of their fundamental human rights by government, corporations, institutions, and families. Those groups that have been injured have the right to obtain from the government, corporation, institution, or family responsible for the injuries, that which they need to repair and heal themselves. In addition to being a demand for justice, it is a principle of international human rights. So that, that's a definition that we got from Encobra. Uh, I think that was the one from Encobra. Uh, yeah. And in Cobra, as you can see, it's the National Coalition of Blacks and Reparation in America. So that they're, they're on the move. They're actually deeply involved in HR 40. We're going to keep moving. So I want to talk a little bit about the history. Uh, I'm going to stand over here. Uh, talk a little bit about the history uh, because what I was able to discover was is that there's quite a, quite a bit of movement on, um, on uh, reparations in our history. Uh, there, there was a time when uh, former slaveholders um, maybe 900 of them or so, uh, were able to go back. Now, this, is, this doesn't make sense to you because you're not, you're not going to be able to contextualize this, is that um, they were getting $300 for each slave that they released. Okay? That was their reparations. From who? <clears throat> From the government. Yeah. So that was their reparations. Um, so that, there, was, there was also a part two of that where slaves actually came back and said, hey, um, nobody claimed for me, so... I get money. You know, so there was some of that going on. And so that, that was actually happening. This, that's, this is the United States of America, folks. So back in, um, you know, in, in, uh, you know, towards the end of the, the, uh, the close of the Civil War, um, there was this dude... Uh, named Stanton. Stanton is one you want to remember because Stanton was kind of instrumental in also creating what they call the Freedmen Bureau. Okay, how many people heard of the Freedmen Bureau? Because they don't teach that in our schools. Freedmen Bureau was established as a part of the reconstruction process. They established colleges and health in healthcare institutions, largely for black and poor white people in the South, from which the HBCUs emerged. Amen. There you go. Okay, so Edward Stan was huge. Now he was fired by and by Andrew Johnson after Lincoln got assassinated, but that's another story. So um, what General Sherman was able to do at the close of the Civil War, uh, we understand that the Civil War was the biggest massacre, internal massacre in United States history. In fact, the biggest massacre that has, the United States has ever existed that has ever existed in the United States history in battle. 620,000 people died because we were trying to figure out whether we wanted slavery as a nation. That's our nation, okay, that we have to own, okay? So General Sherman at the time, um, and this was right about the same time, because right before the close of the war, Lincoln was assassinated. It was a hate crime. Yes, he was killed because he made the decisions that he made because um, it's, my history books tell me uh, that John Wilkes Booth said something when he jumped off onto the stage uh, that alluded to the fact that it was in retaliation for the emancipation. Uh, did anybody read this in school? Okay, okay all right, so I'm just, because everybody's kind of looking at me like, really? So, so he's dead. Uh, Sherman's in the field, field commander, and he's saying, I'm going to give you guys 40 acres. I'm going to give you 40 acres, you 40 acres, you, no, not you, you and you, yeah, just you. Okay, maybe you, okay, not these guys. So, so anyway, the point I'm getting at is, is he's walking around and he's, he's, it was a done deal. It was an agreement and all that other stuff. Well, after Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson came in and he said, no, take it back. They took it all back. So we're talking about uh, all the way down <laughs> through South Carolina and Georgia. Yeah, this is a real story. Um, so they had, they had actually issued um, a reparations to folks in the South who were former slaves. Lincoln's assassinated. 
Um, they tried to get it back through the legislature, and it was vetoed by Andrew Johnson, the same Andrew Johnson that, that shares the reputation of our current commander-in-chief, who was also impeached, by the way. Okay? Um, so there are other instances that I'm not going to go into right now, but there are other instances where um, there were attempts for uh, reparations along the way throughout our history. We won't talk more about those, but I will talk about some implementations because uh, Heart Mountain, uh, because we, yes, we did intern Japanese. We did that. Okay, so there, there was a, repar repar a reparations that was paid out on that. Also, there, there's an ongoing reparations that's being paid out uh, from, 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 from the atrocities that happened in, 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 um, in, in Germany in, and uh, Eastern Europe in uh, World War II. Um, there was the, uh, the, many people probably heard of the Indian Claims Commission, uh, which was kind of a nightmare because that money was issued and then it was micromanaged by the government themselves and many of the folks who were supposed to be recipients never saw that money and there, there was an actual apology uh, to Hawaii. Yeah, Hawaii. Hawaii is Hawaii, okay? It's, it is Hawaii. It's like, think about it. The people are kind of, you know, you see what I'm getting at? It's, so there, what they decided to do about that was to apologize. So there was an apology. Um, we know about the horrible Tuskegee experiment. Um, experiments. Okay, let's get it straight, because there were, there were many. Um, so there was, a, um, there was a payment, and it took them maybe another 24 years, but they finally got an apology out of them. Um, OCOE uh, acknowledgement. Uh, I'm not going to go into that right now, because frankly, I caught it, but I don't remember what it was. So I, that's your homework. Um, the Rosewood Massacre that happened in Florida, what happened? A black guy was accused of, of raping a, a, a white woman, so they burned the whole town down. Okay, that's happened probably 40, 50, 60 times across the United States, to include uh, Black Wall Street, uh, most with all impunity. Okay, this is the only one that I could find where there was an apology or there was a reparation. And then, of course, there's a huge uprising, this, this I don't want to call it an uprising, but as a smackdown on police in Chicago. Uh, which ultimately resulted in a $5.5 million settlement. What I'm getting at is, is yeah, um, reparations is not a new idea. In fact, the House of Representatives, the United States House of Representatives, apologized for slavery. The United States House of Representatives apologized for slavery in 2008. I'll let you just take a minute to, to, to absorb that. I think the thing, the, the thing to think about, too, is, is that so did the Senate. Now, notice their disclosure. Nothing in this resolution authorizes or supports any claim against the United States. Serves as a settlement of any claim against the United States. That's our country. That's what's going on, okay? So, you know, on the heels of all of this, somewhere, and this was 2009, 20 years before this, John Conyers introduced H.R. 40. 20 years before this, John Conyers introduces H.R. 40. It goes nowhere. It doesn't even make it out of committee. As we say here, it stayed on the wall. Okay? It goes nowhere. This is a little bit about H.R. 40. I'm going to let you just read that first part. Not that I haven't had enough coffee, but I'm going to get right at this. So, again, <laughs> to establish, now imagine this. <laughs> We're talking about a bill that says that they just want to establish, <coughs> excuse me, a commission to study and consider. I'm going to say it one more time. <coughs> they want to establish a commission to study and consider, okay, uh, a, a national apology and proposal for rep a proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery. Twenty years later, nothing. Ten years after that, just this last year, last August, finally, they decided to look at it. I'll tell you another secret. Not one senator in our legislature wanted to touch H-478, to even introduce it, to even sponsor it. Not one. 
You mean this sin here? This sin in your state. Yeah. And you know what the wording is? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's see if we can get over there. You can go back and take a look at the findings on HR 40. I'm not going to bog you down with that, okay? Oh, boy. Where, how did I get over there? Oh, there it is. What was that, anyway? <laughs> Good Lord, Mark. What are you doing? Hey, look! There it is! The United Nations Human... That's, that's the slide. Isn't that what we started with? Yeah. Okay, looky there. I outthought myself. Anyway, um, this is the statement of purpose of this bill to study. It proposes to establish a task force to study and consider a state apology and proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery and make recommendations <laughs> to the general. I mean, it's almost funny. I, I'm, I'll come right back at you, okay? Um, and, and appropriate remedies. So, after this next question, I'm going to tell you how the committee, who, uh, what, the, who um, the Government Operations Committee responded to its introduction and, and why it's still up on the wall. Great. I'm a little confused mm -hmm. that between the national mm -hmm. bill and apology and the Vermont bill and mm -hmm. apology. So you keep saying 30 years. Is that for the Vermont bill? No. Oh, it's for the national. Yeah. Okay. Let and me just re let me just yeah. repeat your question and make sure we're talking apples and apples. Okay. Michelle, I know if I get this right, it's going to be hell to pay for. It, so. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the deal, Avalon. Here's what you heard, right? Mm -hmm. What I said was the. H.R. 40 was introduced in 1989 by the late Senator John Conyers, and it was not taken up for 30 years. Is that what you heard? Yes. Okay. So when you get home, talk to your mother and tell her that she needs to listen more closely. But you okay. didn't say national, federal government, or state. Okay. So the, the so H.R. 40 is, is definitely a national policy. I'm sorry. Yeah. You don't have to be sorry. I'm just giving you a hard time because uh -huh. I've got a chance. I'm going to tell you a quick story about Michelle before we move on. So we were, we were in class um, the first time I came to UVM a couple, two or three weeks ago. And I was giving this similar presentation. And, and I said, I know. I said, I know. I know. Because nobody really wants to hear this. And it's hard to take in. It's really difficult. It is. I know. It's, trust me. Researching this, painful. Very painful, right, to take a look at this. So when you're telling people this, it's hard to absorb a lot of this, and, the, and many people are sitting in the room, and I said to this to the whole class, 28 folks in the class, God is my witness on my mother's grave. I said, somebody's going to want to call bullshit, right? I said, and if you want to call bullshit, call bullshit. Guess what Michelle said? Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was a good opportunity for us, not only to get to know each other. Now, look who's here. Right. Of, of all of the 28 people that were in that class, look who came you know, of course, you only had to come over from Barry, but... No, I live in St. Albans now. I don't believe you. Okay. So anyway, so, but, but the point here is, is so I don't even know the point. Let's keep it moving. So here, the thing with H-478 is simply that we introduced this in government operations in the House, and many of the questions involved, who's going to pay for it? Why do we have to pay for this? you telling me that um, it's going to come out of my taxes? So, now granted, we didn't really get an opportunity to share with the legislators maybe some of the, the upfront stuff that I shared with you at the beginning of this, um, the hidden in plain sight component. Um, we certainly offered it here because this was the very first place that we offered it when we kicked this series off. It was the very first series event that we, the forum event that we did in this room about a month ago, okay? And we continue to offer it around the state and you're still welcome, all of you. So the thing here is, is that um, we're doing the best we can to try to get the word out. But again, it's important to understand that, you know, we, we sat in the class just the other day, a couple of days ago, and there was, what, five arguments? Five arguments. I said, what are the arguments, right? And, and there was maybe five arguments about, what were some of those arguments? You remember? Say your name. Basha. Basha. Yes. Uh, well, some of I remember was that uh, why Vermont? Why Vermont? Such a small state. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Or why now? Why it's now? like a dead horse we've been eating for mm -hmm. so many years. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting ones was that the now, hold on for a second. I just want to qualify this conversation because this was the 28 students that are in it. This is the graduate class, okay? And probably uh, a good good portion of the class are, are um, uh, from Vermont as well, right? Yeah. What program is that? The Masters MSW Social Work. Social work. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I thought was interesting that somebody brought up that they had conversations with some African American friends that. The African American community, from their point of view, did not want to pass um, a, a, rep a reparation bill or a apology because they were afraid that the white community would then go, "We're done. Mm -hmm. we, we already apologized. What else could you possibly want?" Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think you, I think you mentioned um, you know, the fear of white backlash. Yeah, there was one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know what I said about that? Yep, it's exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And bring it. Let's do this. You don't, you don't just not do something that's right because of fear of backlash, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, made a, I made my mind up many years ago, a few years ago, that uh, I was willing to walk, walk in this, right? And to do the work that I'm doing, no matter what it costs. Um, what was the counter argument? That I offered, do you recall? I'm just trying to test you guys to see if you guys. Are who's gonna pay for it? I don't know. Who was the con what was the counter argument that I offered to all of them? Oh, you offered yeah. to just talking okay. about it. It's just a conversation, and to have difficult conversations mm -hmm. would cause people to think and be in uncomfortable places mm -hmm. and to examine themselves. Almost, almost. That's really close. Pretty damn close. My my counter argument was is it is a task force. They're going to consider, you know, an apology and to determine whether or not it would be appropriate for reparations. What does it hurt to allow some people, understanding that there's been injury, right, to allow some people go and make a decision as to whether, whether or not there's even going to be an apology, just to talk about whether they wanted to apologize or whether they wanted to offer a, a um, reparations. And isn't it rather pretentious of one individual to say, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think we should have a task force go look at it. I just want to shut this down right here because I don't feel comfortable because you might come after my check. You might come after my money. Does that resonate with anybody in the room? What I'm saying? Yeah. It's just a task force. Mm -hmm. Questions? How much does a task force cost? I was just going to drop that pin. Ding. What? How much does a task force cost in <clears throat> Vermont taxpayers? Just curious. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I think that, um, I think what's in this bill, what's in this bill, the I think it, there may be there may be a couple million dollars tied to it because this is this is not this is a this is a full staffed task force with with support uh, consultative arm investigative arm the whole nine yards this is a task force that's going to get it done it's not a summer study this is a task force okay so I think what what would what would go to appropriations if I'm not mistaken. And I'm going to charge you for homework to go and do it. Because when you ask me questions like that and I can't answer, since you're a student and I'm not, you should, be, you should go in and, and come back and tell me that when I come back and see you. I'll, I'll have the answer. Send me an email too. Okay. But, the, but yes, there, there, there is a cost on it. But what I'm saying, is, what my visceral response to that question, quite frankly, is, is we're the richest nation on the planet. Okay? And there's clearly has been harm that has been done. We talked about all of the disparities that we're operating against right now. If you, you know, we, this goes all the way back to where, um, you know, where we were a nation where nobody was really paying for labor or nobody even asked for the land, you know. And as a person of color, 
you know, even if a legislator looks at me and asks me how much reparations cost, I'll be honest with you, and I look at the camera when I say this, is it's painful to hear that question as an argument. For, for the argument of reparations, from, especially from a political and economically, um, from, a, you know, from a person who has political, from a white man who has political and economic power, to hear that question is disconcerting. I asked it because... Uh, it's not about you. Yeah, You're not a white man. Get out of here. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, it seems to me, since we've had free land, free labor, and all this stuff since 1619, how come we don't want to pay that back? Huh. Uh, that's um, that's a, that's a kind of the perspective that many of the folks that I've talked to have, and I think it's not even about that. Why don't we just want to talk about it? Is my question. Right. Why, why, don't, why don't we want to just have somebody go off and talk about it? And have it come back to us and tell us what you discovered. So with that, we're gonna, we're gonna break here. Uh, we're gonna break off into two groups. You guys can stay on this side. I see you, Roy. And you, you guys can stay on this side. And uh, what I want to do is, is I want to get a conversation going um, about what you know you've discovered from what we've from the discussion up until now. What your thoughts are? Exchange some thoughts and ideas. Um, I'm going to come back with some, you know, with some with some additional details about where we are and what we're going to be doing next. But I I didn't want to get you out here tonight without giving everybody an opportunity to process this and to talk about it. And also, let's come back uh, with some tough questions and also some, um, or, or maybe just some observations. Um, and if you have some thoughts on the, um, the legislative process, that would be helpful as well. Um, what's wrong with what we're doing? Uh, what's right about what we're doing? Uh, how, how would you want to, you know, how would you want to do this differently? Um, does this even make sense? What the hell is this anyway? Take some time. Uh, take about maybe 15 minutes and I'll, I'll come back in and check on you, okay? I'm going to go and find some more coffee somewhere. <laughs> no, I was just going to offer up a nugget that perhaps will help the discussion. Yeah, uh, I forgot you, about you. You, you, you hooked into, hmm? excuse me, uh, the fear factor in terms of uh, reluctance to have a dialogue. Yeah. And I think that is so critical, not only in terms hmm of addressing that in the <clears throat> secular community, but also in the sacred community. Mm -hmm. Because many times these people in the office of the pulpit or priesthood, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, are main barriers for even having the dialogue. Uh, a small example, uh, just a while ago I wrote <clears throat> commentary for one of Vermont's so-called liberal denominations, and, and I quoted Reverend Frederick Douglass, the pastor took it upon himself to pull the commentary and confronted me saying, I have conservative white, oh, I was the only black person who <laughs> mentioned this to this particular church. He pulled the commentary and his resp confrontational response to me was, I have conservative white people in my congregation, and I don't want Frederick Douglass, or what you're saying about Frederick Douglass, to disturb my conservative white people in the church. Mm. Wow. That's bad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll be preaching here on Sundays, don't worry about that. And, 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 and you know, this guy is in one of the more endowed churches yeah. with a regular congregation mm -hmm. here in the state. Vermont, abolitionist, preacher, mm -hmm. this is the, the squat that he is feeding his congregation, and he's supposed to be in a leadership position. Yeah. 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 He hadn't heard that old adage about how his job was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Amen. <laughs> we have an house, man. Yeah. You got 13 minutes. What? You paused the pod? You paused it? Okay, you got 15 minutes. 
apologies or acceptance of responsibilities of um, uh, forgiveness. Uh, what, you know, how did, you know, how does that really impact in us the absence of that as a nation? How could it, how could it be impacting us as a nation in terms of where we are? It is 2020, okay? And we are at a place where we have more hate crimes and we have more backlash, white lash, than probably at any time since almost maybe the civil rights movement. Uh, post civil rights movement, hard post civil rights movement, uh, soft post civil rights movement. So talk about that. What role does reparations or could reparations play in that? You know, think about that. Talk about that. So let me one question. I know these guys, man. These guys are talking about the Yankees. So dinner. Um, who's sticking around so we can go out and have dinner after this? Oh. Where are we going to You pay him? I'm, I'm, I'm buying one person dinner in the room. Oh, it's me. What? It's him. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's my guy right there. Um, yeah, he's a student. Yeah. You get tired of robbing an egg after a while, man. I, I, I talk to a lot of students, man, so, you know. Yeah. You know he probably eats better than I do. As well. I want to hear from you. Uh, let's take about 10 minutes. Uh, you, can you guys, you guys want to crank it up and just tell us about you know, your discussion? You don't have to, it doesn't have to be concise. Um, I would like somebody to capture the notes from the entire conversation though. So if somebody can like capture notes from everything, because I'm going to take a picture of those because I, I want to kind of fold that back into the stuff that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is Avalon, just like King Arthur. <laughs> yeah, just wanted to let you know. Cool. Um, what do you guys got? What, what do you got? What are you working with? Okay, so we wanted who was going to do the reimbursement. What? And then we talked about the bill actually spells out who would be in the reimbursement. Um. Yeah. So the bill spells out who they were: community members, people of minority groups. Um. Who would make up the task force? Ah, yeah. So, and my mom, who actually read the whole bill, said that it's actually spelled out as community members, people of color, minority groups, um, and then gender equality as well. So it's not just a bunch of men representing. In yeah, God forbid. Um, and then that then <laughs> so okay. like people. The state would select people as well, so then there was state selection, and there would be people who would volunteer, and then people who were voted in. Mm -hmm. So it would be a very large group of people. It wouldn't be just a couple people representing others. Mm -hmm. um, and then financial, how much would be granted back, and what about health care, would that be included? Mm -hmm. um, and we started talking about who cares if it makes people uncomfortable. Um, and we start talking about the wording of how it's spelled out. Mm -hmm. And we talked a lot about how currently as it is, we think that the word slavery <laughs> shuts people down in conversation because it makes white people feel awkward. And we talk about slavery without saying slavery. That's, that's the key, right? <laughs> well, the thing, well, well, I mean, slavery. I mean, like, you know, just kind of like unwilling well, work. Well, we think is you can bring it up without that word in the title, and then when they get in the room, rip off a piece of paper and be like, surprise. Um, but we were talking about how. We were talking about white fragility. Yeah, about how they get really. Not exactly. Well, no, you get defensive. You you said it really well. What happened? You said to open to get people to open up. Right. Yeah. You about freaking out. It's the similar conversation you have about climate change. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. So there are certain people that as soon as you say the phrase climate change, the conversation stops. But if you don't use that phrase and continue the discussion, maybe asking questions mm -hmm. like, do you want clean air? Mm -hmm. Do you want clean water? Mm -hmm. Anyone who says no to those questions is crazy and should stop talking to them immediately. Mm -hmm. But those two questions, if you say yes to, that also means you're in support of fighting and mitigating climate change mm -hmm. without using that phrase. 
Now, how to do it in this context is uh, obviously different, um, but the concept is the same. Got it. Thanks for that. What else? Um, we talked about what kind of time frame would it look like? How far back would you want to go? We started talking about Australia and how they eventually apologized and they um, for their Aboriginal groups and they gave free college mm -hmm. to children. Um, mm -hmm. And then we started talking about Vermont and how Vermont kind of has that with Abnet and some of the other tribes, mm -hmm. but it's not really a full corporation because you, know, you have to apply for it. Um, so, and then we talked about how we kind of just talked about that, but words and how you phrase things matters because mm -hmm. how you bring up the conversation, somebody may be very combative or they may be more willing to listen to you, um, depending on how you so, so Thank you for that. And other thoughts from the room? Anybody else? Adeline just took over. Well, she was like that. That's good. Of making up, so it worked well. But yeah. what, what the I think main idea was that. You need another Adeline. To really school. find a way to approach people in community so they will be open to the conversation mm -hmm. and not shutting down. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we just thought about is specific language that it, uh, it really sometimes is accusatory and mm -hmm. people take it personally mm -hmm. and don't feel personally responsible for right. slavery so they feel it, it's not really reversed to them and mm -hmm. don't want to be part of this conversation. Got it. Got it. So, so you know, how do you communicate this? In a way that that makes folks feel more comfortable about comfortable about having a conversation, right? Yes. Okay. What else? Good work. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, we're going to go to the next group. What happened to Mike? You took off. Oh no, he just went. To okay. Oh, I thought you started. So you. So who's the? Is that your recorder? I think so. Are we waiting for you? We went for you. For me? Yeah. Or, oh, because I was taking some of the notes. Oh, yeah, aren't you, aren't you still involved in this process? Or are you just over here well, shooting the notes. Shit with coach? Um, I guess the main thing was that, uh, I, oh, well, there was a couple things. The first thing was that, you know, like having your presence in a room to, like, ask questions about this in the first place is, like, a very, very kind of minimal but important step in the process of understanding this all. And, we talked about, you know, the how much does it cost question, which really should not be a part of the equation at all. Like, we should be focusing on the end uh, we. I'm not sure what universal we that is, but that's our group kind of. We is good. Yeah, okay. Um, that, you know, the benefits, like what are the, the you know, the, the results that we're going to get out of um, this. Like that is the, you know, that's the, that's the most important thing. And then, the, um, the asking that question is kind of like just cuts the discussion. Mm -hmm. That like kind of like what you're talking about. And then we talked about money and value mm -hmm. and maybe like that part would come in after the discussion or after you know you talk about the benefits of all of this because I could see that like talking about money and like going off like the gold currency and all that can be confusing for people to think about and could be a way for people to, you know, uh, not want to not engage in this type of conversation just because it's a little bit um, complex, but it could definitely be part of the consideration, like, you know, after talking about, like, the benefits of all of this, or mm -hmm. maybe included, but, yeah, <clears throat> I don't know, if anything else. Oh, and then some books were recommended. Which books were recommended? Yeah. Um, which one? I have it in my notes, but you ABC. Uh, one, um, <clears throat> Edward um, Baptist book, The Half Has Never Been Told. The Half Has Never Been Told. Uh, secondly, um, Abram X. Uh, Kennedy's book, both of his latest books. 2016 one entitled Stamp from the Beginning, Stamp 2019 the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. How to Be an Anti-Racist. And uh, let's see, was there another one? I thought there were three that I recommended. That was three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only thing I 
have is that we also talked a little bit about your question of what happens spiritually to mm -hmm. a country that hasn't addressed these issues. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a really important question. Like, for my part, I did a lot of work in South Africa after mm -hmm. apartheid came apart and the, saw some of the results of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission there. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of work. I mean, they did a lot. There's, they're way ahead of us on sure, yeah. talking about racism and overcoming it. But even though they went through that huge process, the economic system didn't change. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my colleagues in South Africa like to say that the whites invented apartheid and we're implementing it. Wow. Because there's no real difference in the economy mm -hmm. despite all the changes that have happened mm -hmm. in the political system. Mm -hmm. And so I think that points out how, yeah, you need to have the conversations. Yes, you need to think about what mm -hmm. it means spiritually, but you also need to address the economic underpinnings mm -hmm. of the problem. Mm -hmm. in the first place. Thanks for that. Anything else collectively? Any, I mean, if, if you had a chance to hear from one another, anybody want to make any, com any additional comments on what you've heard or fill in the blanks? In thinking about the spiritual, we didn't get to that, but um, what I think of when there's an apology <laughs> given is the person has to be ready to receive the apology. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if the black community is ready to receive the apology, mm -hmm. you know, because just it's so much against them, you know, mm -hmm. just it's so mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that you can't just beat somebody down and they go, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, and expect them to accept the apology. I think, mm -hmm. like maybe like with South Africa, there needs to be a lot more work done to show that we really mean it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Michelle. Also, who's we? Just to, just to yes. frame that, because like I, I'm, I guess I could do my own research on this, mm -hmm. but who is involved really in the conversations in Vermont, and like the Vermont House of uh, Reps and in the, you know, in DC? Because mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I, I guess what I feel like I can bring to a conversation is like in a micro scale, like inclusive movements that have happened at UVM mm -hmm. and like which ones have, you know, succeeded and which ones like haven't kind right. of. Right. Um, but the one, like I, I was a member of No Names for Justice, I don't mm -hmm. yeah, yes. so um, that was a really special movement mm -hmm. where people, you know, there was no tokenizing, it wasn't like, oh, we don't have mm -hmm. a black person, we don't have someone from, you know, Muslim student union, mm -hmm. we don't have, like, a queer person, like, right. it was all, the networking was there, and mm -hmm. it was inclusive to start with. So I, I guess I'm just questioning, you know, like, I'm here to support and do dirty work and not have my name attached to it if I don't, like, if it doesn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. Like, I can do groundwork, I can do whatever type of work, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering, like, I, I guess this is kind of a lot of mind jargon, but um, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm having a hard time seeing, like, the inclusiveness mm -hmm. of the unit and, like, the, the networks mm -hmm. between everything. And maybe that's just because I don't know about the processes, but, and then, like, how this, how this group interacts with other groups, Mm -hmm. Maybe that was talked about last time. But. <clears throat> One of the things that you're saying is a great so mm -hmm. uh, segue into three points I'll share. One is we really don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And too frequently we make assumptions. Uh, you know, as a professional fundraiser, one of the trainings that I've often done with folk going after major donors is don't judge that person's pocket and potential by what's in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And too frequently, we as humans do that, and as a consequence, we don't move the dial. Mm -hmm. Because we're too focused on you know, that, that, that self, which does not represent everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an attitude here in the West, uh, especially in medicine and other areas, with medicine in particular, that you know, we're the greatest. We have doctors who have all of the answers, and there was a long time, and I think all of us will admit, before the AMA, American Medical Association, opened up to the reality of cures and advancement in medicine in Asian countries and other countries. 
uh, we still close our eyes to the education that can, I won't go into the name of the city or the nation, where the education is equal to and superior to what you get in America. Uh, the thought is, well, you know, it doesn't cost as much over there, therefore it can't be as comfortable as we are here. So it's, you know, the internal self-important and superiority uh, that stymies or stops the level of collective going forward. <coughs> Coach, you your information right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I have some notes too, if you want. Yeah. 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 So we're gonna we're gonna have to. I don't mean to cut everybody off, but we're gonna have to move along because actually we only got about 17 minutes left. Okay. Um, I wanna. Um, I want to. Um, you're out of here. Yeah. Get over here, you. Good to see you. Well, I'm gonna see you as well. Yeah. We'll see you together soon. Okay. All right. I I wanna I wanna just. Just point out just a couple things, and I'm sorry to have had to cut this conversation off because I would love to continue this conversation for the next 30 minutes because there's a lot to unpack, and and it's good to hear um, and and to be heard in in this. This is part of the reason why we're doing this is because we're trying to create spaces where folks can have conversations where they know that they're not going to be ridiculed. They know that they're not going to be ostracized, that their opinions are valued, um, that there is no wrong answers, um, that you know we understand that you know in order to answer some of these questions that we need you know the collective. Um, so this is really really valuable. Um, you going to say something? Quick question: yeah. Would this allow for spaces to be created for people who don't know about the certain history in their states? So, like, say they've grown up in an area where their family has always been very, very conservative. Mm -hmm. They may see things a certain way. They have different values. Mm -hmm. Would they be able to go into these spaces and ask questions? Mm -hmm. I'm going to answer that question, um, but I'm going to defer to my answer. If you just give me a moment, okay? Because I'm going to. What I want to do is, is I want to. I want to tie this up, and then I'm going. To, what I'm going to do is, is part of what I'm going to say is actually going to answer that Can question. Can I ask me a question just a little more specifically? Mm -hmm. real quick? So if that person was to walk in and ask a question that most of society would see as something that, like, that's a no-brainer, mm -hmm. obviously, everybody knows that, is that mm -hmm. a space where they can ask those questions where they just need to know, mm -hmm. or they want to learn more, but they feel stupid asking people from their own communities? Mm -hmm. um, would that open up spaces mm -hmm. where that could happen? Okay, so I, I, again, I'm going to come back to answering that, but I'm going to, I'm going to interpret your question as, is this particular bill is it going to facilitate the opening of spaces where people can communicate freely, where they can ask questions without being criticized, without, and also coming from a space where they may not necessarily have a knowledge base or even experience you know, this, these particular types of situations? Is that going to come as a result of what it is that we're talking about? Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to come to that. Okay, I'm just going to park it just for a second, and I'll, I'll do all due respect. So what I wanted to do is, is, before I did that, I wanted to kind of you know, create like an amalgam of what it is that we just experienced. Because one thing that I saw is, is that this is a very complicated conversation. This is a very difficult conversation. Okay? This, is, this is not a straightforward discussion. Um, the other thing is, is, there are a lot of things that are a, aspects of what it is that we were discussing that would actually, if you think about it, be a component of, and this rubs up against your question, this would be a component of the actual establishment of the task force itself. So there are questions, there are comments, there are thoughts, there are ideas that I would say that probably upwards of maybe two thirds of our conversation that we just had would actually be an output from the task force itself. So I want you just to sit with that just for a second because this is kind of the point I was making at the beginning of this conversation, or towards the beginning of this, is, is that we need a task force to answer some of these questions. And I hope that partially answers your question, okay? And, but there's another part, and that, and that part is, is how do we prepare the hearts and minds of people to even engage in this conversation so we can get to a point to where that task force is even viable or possible, okay? And those are some of the things we're working on, in fact, Sitting in this room is a part of that answer. 
In fact, this particular series that we're having right now, this uh, Hidden in Plain Sight, the statewide tour that provides a context of our historical, uh, our, his, our history as a nation, and really um, provides some context for not just definition, but uh, the, um, the fabric of systemic racism, which is a very difficult conversation for any white person to have. Okay? These are the conversations that we're having across the state. So, the, so it's very, very well taken, you know, the, the rest of the conversation, the conversation about where are those spaces, how do we say these things in a way where folks are not going to get antsy, how do we say these things in a way where folks, I mean, at the onset of this meeting tonight, I provided a framework in, in, and I kind of went backwards from today, and I went back through the civil rights mo movement. I went, I came back through. I went back through the, the um, from from 1910 to 1970. I talked about the Great Migration. We went through um, uh, sharecropping. We talked about lynching, and we talked about the Ku Klux Klan. We talked. We talked about the history of this nation. And the, the reason why I was doing that was because I was establishing a framework for us to operate from to be able to give us an understanding of what it is that we're actually talking about so that we can have a conversation about this thing called systemic racism. And here's the homework that I'll give you, I think I said this in the class, is, is go away from this meeting, go walk to one white person who's not familiar with this topic, get in front of them and say, I want to talk to you about systemic racism, right? And wait five minutes. And then they will tell you that they're not a racist. It's not about that, okay? The whole conversation about systemic racism has nothing to do with who's a racist and who's not a racist. It has to do with the constructs, the statutes, the constitution. You know, it has to do with, you know, the, 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 the structure of the United States, the systems that are in place, the things that intrinsically deal an unfair hand to people of color in this nation as a result of how it was built, okay? So those are the things that we're trying to address here. And in order to do that, we can't really deal with it without naming what it is that caused it. And, and by the way, the um, United States has indeed, as we covered earlier, already offered an apology. And, and not just from the House of Representatives, but also from the Senate. And as you said yourself, Michelle, an apology with, with no uh, substance is just an apology. So clearly, that apology didn't really do us a whole lot of good. There needs to be some action to it. Um, I was reading uh, in preparation for a sermon um, a little bit about you know, this whole idea of forgiveness and this whole idea of apologies and this, this concept of when you're, when you're going and you're going to worship or you're going to give gifts or something like that, that you just need to step back and think a little bit about who's mad at me. Because a lot of times... Not only does that inhibit your blessing, but it also inhibits theirs because they're so busy being mad at you that they don't have time to receive what it is that's there for them. Okay? So there's a spiritual concept in there as well. So um, there are, we are not the only ones struggling, and that's, sometimes that's uh, disheartening, but sometimes it's good news. Um, there are many states, uh, California, New York, Florida, Texas, Pennsylvania, are all dealing with this thing called... Um, reparations, this conversation called reparations, and they're all doing it in their own ways. The good news is, is we, have, we also have some national partners, and many of them have presence here in, in uh, the state of Vermont. Um, the NAACP and the ACLU are no-brainers, but did you know the National Education Association, as well as the Episcopal Church, have a national, they've made a national statement on HR 40, which is the policy that was drafted by the late Con uh, John Conyers, uh, at a national level that was just introduced this last year. So we also know that the National Education Association is probably one of the most uh, prominent, um, um, wow, prominent unions uh, in the state. That's, my, that's how my brain's working. Uh, and as well as, um, uh, as, well as the um, Episcopal Church, not only does the Episcopal Church you know, have a huge presence here, but they also and let's look at this thing contextually because we've already, we, keep, keep in mind, I told you a little while ago that we've already moved PR2. Let's pause there for a minute. PR2 is an 
anti-slavery constitutional amendment. I think that kind of relevant in this conversation since we're talking about reparations. But we'll come back to PR2. Um, but the Episcopal Church actually, they you know, have gone on record unanimously in supporting that as well. Uh, so we're optimistic that they would support us there. You read a little bit from the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America in their explanation uh, that's uh, in COBRA. Okay, so there are, those are just a small handful of, um, of, of organizations that are, are behind this. Some of these folks are no longer with us. Um, uh, uh, who is that? Julian Castro, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, Camilla Harris. I forgot to put Bernie Sanders up there. Bernie Sanders actually, um, the reason why is because at the time, I think when I was thinking about this, he hadn't, I hadn't gotten the word back that he'd officially signed off on saying, yes, I support HR 40. So Bernie went in and signed off on that. So he's behind it as well. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about some of, see, because this is, this is if something is politi being politicized at a national level, then should it be important at a state level? So obviously Bernie's not going to chime in on what's going on with H four seventy eight. Just like Coach, he didn't chime in on what was going on with H four ninety two with uh, Act four fifty four. But at least we know that he's supportive of the concept, and I'm pretty confident that if he read our bill, he probably would go for it because well, we plagiarized it from H R forty. Um, I think what I'm going to do here is, is just pause for a second and talk. In closing, uh, a little bit about PR2 um, before I take your questions because I want to hear from you about what you've seen tonight. The constitutional amendment process, uh, this is kind of a bonus because I, I want to try to build for you just for a moment, if you just bear with me just for a moment, we're almost at the end here. I want to build for you what we've, uh, what we've created just so you can kind of get an illustration of what we've done here in, in, this, um, in this legislature. Now, Representative Kevin Coach Christie was here at the, at the onset when we first marched in here. So are you, Rick. When we first marched in here with H-492 uh, back at the beginning of 2017, which became Act 54. I cannot, I cannot emphasize how important that particular bill is, okay? I think it was with the help of Representative, former Representative Kaya Morris, uh, it was with the help of uh, Deanna, uh, Representative Deanna Gonzalez, uh, our current Attorney General, um, uh, T.J. Donovan, uh, and others. Uh, we were able to march this bill down. We didn't get what we wanted, but we got something that created what, it, what exists today as the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. They just dropped a report last week, or last month, rather, uh, and what they're doing is they're taking a consistent and a persistent approach in examining the, examining the, the, the so-called criminal justice system and determining where those disparities exist and making recommendations on how to go about addressing them, okay? Like I said earlier, the second thing that came out of that was the Attorney General's and the Human Rights Commission's task force, which examined all other systems of government, okay? So they formally came back and said, hey, we've got disparities across housing, education, employment, health services access. Are you beginning to see the breakthrough that this bill produced? Because this was the first time that officially and governmentally on record that they came out and actually made these statements, okay? And that's been memorialized. Now, fast forward the following year, um, which was in the same biennium, uh, what we were able to pass, because we went back and did a second pass at this thing, because we, we wanted to get what we originally came for, was we, we got what we call the Racial Equity Director, the Executive Director of Racial Equity, which is Susana Davis. She's here today. She came over from New York. She reports it to the governor's office. Actually, maybe Susan Miller, uh, Susan uh, Young. Um, and uh, there's also a racial equity panel. So that is the foundation upon which we built. But from the onset, from the beginning in 2017, this language, we came in to the Constitution and we said, there is language in the Constitution that is unsavory. So this exception where it says that um, slavery is prohibited except for these conditions, which is basically you're under the age of 21, and also if you're being uh, punished for payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, and the like, then you could be a slave, you know, or if it was at your own will. 
So it kind of blows a hole in this whole false narrative that we have as a state that we were the first state to abolish slavery. Because this says that we are the, the, the state with the longest, the, the state that has the longest standing history of having language permitting slavery in it. And that is, what, somewhere around 243 years. This was originally written in 1777. So we sought off to, to get this done. It came, there was a House resolution that came out uh, the year before last, which was largely below the radar. Nobody saw it. It never came off the wall in government operations. We started this biennium uh, by trying to get to, by removing this language, and this is what we came up with. The constitutional amendment process is as such. You have to go through two bienniums. That's four years. Okay, We've gone through the first biennium. The first biennium, you have to get a two-thirds vote in the Senate. Then it's sealed, it's locked down. You cannot change the language in it. It must pass the House of the House, and then it must come back. And then following biennium, that's 21-22, starting next year, and it must pass the Senate and the House again. And then in November of 22, it goes on a general referendum on the ballot. So we're almost about halfway there. Okay. The reason why I bring this up at the end of this conversation is, is it's important to understand the context of all of the things that we're doing here. You know, and, and this also makes it, it should make it easier to understand. Why in the heck would we be talking about res reparations now, Michelle? You said, why now? Why now? And I think this, 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 goes, I'm sorry, this goes to a part of that, part of that answer. It's because we've been building precept upon precept on the work that we've been doing and, and this is just logical that we would be having this conversation about uh, reparations. Uh, that's all I have. I wanted to hear from you. Uh, you can get this slide deck if you, you guys, unless you just like operating your phone. But you can get the slide deck. Um, it might take a minute. Um, I'll, get, I'll give it to you as well because you're going you're gonna to need it for your, um, for your editing, I think. Um, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions in these last few minutes or uh, I want to hear uh, your thoughts about what you've seen tonight and and how we move forward. Uh, I will tell you this is, is the bill is uh, on the on the wall in uh, House Government Operations where um, where our uh, the chair is is uh, Representative Sarah uh, Copeland Hanses. Uh, we have uh, Brian China, Representative China has been in and actually uh, introduced and uh, read over the bill with them. And we, we've yet to have any testimony taken up, and it's our hope that we would be able to at least this uh, session, as we close out the uh, biennium, to at least get some testimony uh, on the record for this. And, and ob obviously, you know, what would be just most amazing is, is if it actually came out of committee, even if it was ugly. You know, if the baby's ugly, it's ugly. Um, get it out of committee, and let's let's get an up-down vote on the floor and see who's who stands where. What are your thoughts? Awesome. I'm just thinking, you know, because you just said that right now you're just halfway through, and you said for 30 years that stayed on the wall. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be clear. So this is the constitutional amendment. So, yeah, so I, I, I want to make sure that this is completely separate from the right. conversation that we were having back there. Yeah, okay. I was talking about the other conversation. Okay. So what do you think made the difference now? Why did you get that far? I don't understand your question. Okay, like what is a, is it a, a different climate to be more receptive to it? Why this is going through right now and it wasn't going She's, before? Uh, I think there's a little confusion mm -hmm. between the federal bill and the Vermont bill. Yeah, I'm talking about the Vermont bill. I'm the Vermont yeah. bill just came into conception now. Begin, beginning of 2017. 2017? No. no, this biennium. This by 2018? 19. 19. Oh. See, it's a two year, it's a two year biennium. See, our cycle is every two years. Okay. So this bill came into effect. Brian Cheenham, so, myself, Selena Colburn, and a few others sponsored that bill. Okay, the bill that is here right now. That was okay. Right. So that's why it's in Vermont now. Right. Okay. So Thank the you. Yeah. So the um where we are right now with 478, just for clarity, um, is, is that the, um, as Coach said, at the beginning of the biennium in 2019, 
which is why the bill has, it starts with a four. I mean, it was you know pretty much close close to the end. Well, you, we usually get we have, we get a lot of bills. But it's you know there could be seven, eight, nine hundred bills in a, in a biennium, you know, from the house. Um, that, so this this is um, this bill came out in nineteen. Um, this that, you know we were doing the PR two constitutional amendment work leading up to it. Um, so this this biennium is the first time it's ever been introduced in Vermont. In fact, okay. Okay. it wasn't introduced in any of those other states at that time. So these other states, they just began introducing it just over this last year, in Texas, in, oh, in Pennsylvania, okay. right? Okay. At the same time, on a national level, yeah. when I when I say HR, um, is it still in the wall? That's that was actually introduced. 30 years ago, the first time it was actually introduced 30 years ago mm -hmm. in, in the yeah. federal bill. Yeah. Okay. So, so it was only for the first time, and this probably goes to the question that you're actually asking, yes. it's just a federal question. So for the first time in history, well, I think they tried it one other time, but I think this is the first time where it seems as though it, it's been taken seriously enough, seriously enough that it may actually come out of committee. Um, this is the first time that has happened. What has happened since then is a good question, because um, this is just a personal opinion. Is is just like the 12 to 15 years that occurred from 1865 to um, 1890, 18, 1880 rather, um, 77, 80, mm -hmm. where there was this you know reconstruction period. What ensued thereafter was a, a tr tremendous and incredible and a very bloody white backlash, mm -hmm. which led which led to uh, because at that time those twelve years or so, you know black black people in America had more political and economic power than we've ever had in United States history. Hard stop. Never been there again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after that, uh, read the third Reconstruction by the Reverend Dr. William Barber. The third reconstruction, because I'm getting ready to walk you through all three of them. Um, it, that, what happened after that, um, it would culminate with, and I won't go through all of the lynching and Jim Crow and, 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 and convict leasing and um, sharecropping and redlining and all, but what it would culminate with is what we would call the civil rights movement. In other words, enough is enough. 54 in a till. Uh, what would it lead? What it would lead to is, is a, a, a legislative surge as well, which was which was met with tremendous backlash. If you were, if you re read your history books, the Supreme Court, for crying out loud, was telling people what they needed to do, and they were so set in their ways they still said no. So we had laws on the books that they still wouldn't didn't want to obey. So there was a huge backlash that came from the civil rights movement, which was an uprising because of oppression and criminalized by our government, okay? Which is why we still have what we call um, political prisoners incarcerated today. And some of them are out of the state, out of the United States. What, what do I mean by that? I see that look on your face. There are folks in the civil rights movement that were arrested that are still incarcerated. And Sakata, uh, uh, Asada Shakur is still in, in Cuba as well. So there was a, there was a huge, they were dropping bombs on, Pencil, on, on Philadelphia. Our own military dropped bombs on us. Okay, so this, this was the second white backlash, the civil rights. And then what happened after that is, is there was, it ushered in the war on drugs. Because from 1968 all the way up until present day, uh, starting with Richard Nixon and every president, not just Republicans, played, played a role in who can be the toughest on crime, because that's what white people want to hear. And the old Dixie Crack South really needs to hear it. And we'll talk about the... Um, We'll talk about that later, but there's a whole thing called the Southern Strategy. But the point I'm making is, is that we're, where that led us to is, is that it led us to an era somewhere around 2008, 2010. And yes, we can. Somebody else came into the White House, right? Black faces in the White House. And it was almost at exactly that time when your current, our current president was the, the head cheerleader for the mass opposition. And what's going on right now is nothing more than a third backlash. Mm -hmm. This is a this is a white lash from from uh, what seemed to be forward progress, 
which is why half of America is trying to make it great again. Hmm. So why now? Yeah. That's why now. Because right now we are we are at a we we've reached that apex once again as a nation. We've reached that apex again. And this is who we are, this is who we've always been, and, and Donald Trump is no, nothing more than a symptom, not the cause, because he was produced, he was just, he's just one of the, he's just the next guy. You know, I told you Woodrow Wilson was showing uh, birth of a nation in the Oval Office. I told you about Andrew Johnson, who said, no, we don't want you to have reparations, take that back, and boom, veto. So it's always been like that, you know. We, our Constitution was written in such a way that said, black people aren't people. Right? It took the 14th Amendment to make it happen, and the 14th to, it took the 14th Amendment to make black people people, but it's been used to protect corporations more than black people. That's the nation that we are. So now, where we are as a nation today, we've just come to this climax, and there's a pe the fever pitch, whereby, because every time you have oppression, you, there's something that, thank God, that we always have. We have pushback. We have activism, which is why I'm here. There's all, you can, when, you, when you get, it was Trayvon Martin who woke me up, okay? So it was Michael Brown who woke me up. So whenever you get that, there's going to be a put, there's going to, and it's not just in the community, it's not just our activists, but even our legislators are standing up and saying, not on my watch. So I think that's, that was a long answer, but. Well, it made a lot of sense. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> that made sense. Are you kidding me? What are, what, what are, as we close out, what are your other thoughts? I just want to hear from you some more. Rick, I know you know all this. You're a subject matter expert. What you got for us? That's how you put somebody it's, it's on It's time, time, to, you know, time to have a conversation. Nothing's going to change. It's time to have a conversation. Yeah, it's difficult, too, because there's this, there's this balance because you got you know, white progressive liberals um, who they've been trying to have this conversation in a different kind of way for years and years and years, and it's just it hasn't been working. It hasn't been working, and and uh, you know, I, so I think that's the that's the painful part of it is is that they're 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 a part of the conversation. It just has to be very direct. It just has to be. There, there's no there's really it. You know, at, at some point or another, it's just like Roy talked about in the church. You know, who, in my opinion, is probably one of the biggest culprits in this whole mess, because uh, it's always been in the name of that, or you know, at least Christian fundamentalism. Right, ostensibly. I mean, if you look at, like Coach just said, you look at what's going on right now across the nation, and, and who's who's standing behind this mess in Washington, and you'll find that you know you'll find that the, the church Christ, Christian fundamentalists are standing behind this guy, supporting him one hundred percent. So anyway, it's all, but it's always been about being able to have those conversations and we just haven't had them because we've always thought that if we just talk very generally. I mean, it's, it's even the, the same thing here. And I, I, the beautiful thing about my job and what I do is, is I, every day I wake up and I, just, I, I live in a way where I just don't have, I, I feel like I just don't have anything to lose. Uh, I don't, political and economic power, I'm not interested in. I'm interested in you know, changing people's lives and making things better. So I can say, that even like the social equity caucus, you know, I think it should be a racial equity caucus, right? I think I think they should be talking about it, you know. I think they because at the at the, the the very centerpiece of this entire economic mess, this thing called capitalism, is just one little linchpin, right? If this whole thing about the, I mean, don't forget about genocide and slavery, because it's what created this whole thing called capitalism. Which created the one percent? This is still about the one percent, isn't it? Amen. This is all still about the one percent, right? And that's the key, because if you pull that out, everything else falls. I have a prediction: S twenty three will not pass. H one hundred seven will not pass. I'm talking about now. What I'm talking about is is I'm talking about uh, livable wages and family care. Why? Because they're starting on the wrong end of the conversation. That's the linchpin. It's about race and racism, okay? It's every, that's what's holding everything. Climate, pretty doggone important. You're not going to get the money for it until you can dismantle this. 
When you dismantle this, the whole house of cards falls. And what they're trying to sell us is they're trying to pit us against one another so we never figure it out. Which is why nobody wants to have this conversation. And we're programmed in such a way as to not know that but still think it's just not a good idea to have a conversation. Right? That's how we were programmed. Why? Because our mother told us. Because our, because our grandmother told her. Because her grandmother told her. Right? But for us to really face this thing, we've got to say that our parents were wrong. Right? I'm right. So, <laughs> I, I talk a little bit too much, but I, I want to thank you all for coming out. I'm going to go and grab something to eat. You guys are welcome to join. And I'm, you know, we can continue the conversation there. And I, I might even have a drink one like this. So thank you all for coming. Can you please take a picture of that and send it to me? I'm going to write them up. It's in my yeah. shorthand okay. cursive. Okay. So, and then she'll email them to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that sound good? But Anybody else? Um, are everybody's mind's clear here? Was that fun? Mm -hmm. I had a blast. <laughs> I want to do this every day. <laughs> Let's come back and do it again tomorrow. All right, guys. Thanks for coming out.